Hi, my name is Eve. In this video series, we are going to explore some of the changes that have taken place in fandom dating all the way back to the 1960s. We will begin today with a brief history of fandom, or the beginning of fandom. Later in the series, we will also cover topics like call-out culture, fan emboldenment, and shipping. A brief history of fandom. Picture this. You're 14 years old. The internet is just becoming a household commodity. YouTube is in its first years. And you can actually have a conversation with another person without bringing anyone's mom or sexually transmitted diseases into it. Something amazing has begun to happen. You're meeting other people who totally dig all the same things you do. The searchability of content and filtering of things you don't enjoy has greatly narrowed your potential friend list down to the people who fit into your nerdy little niche. You've begun making friends in a way that was never possible before, and it's absolutely magical. Email addresses get exchanged, conversations get started, and before you know it, you're having day-long chat conversations over instant messengers and discussing your theories, wishes, and all things fandom in depth. 2007 is when I met several friends who are still good friends to date. To most millennials like myself, this probably sounds familiar. YouTube was indeed fairly new, and our parents had just unbanned it in the house because they realized it was not created for adult videos. I had discovered something that would later come to be called Spandy, or the pairing off, shipping, of fictional characters SpongeBob SquarePants and Sandy Cheeks from the renowned and beloved children's show, SpongeBob SquarePants. The show had been in syndication for a decent number of years at that point, and it catered more to an older audience. I didn't feel terribly out of place at the age of 14 being into a kid's show, and acknowledged my nerdiness and love of fandom. I made a tight group of friends in my first year, which grew into a large community of shippers. We eventually migrated away from YouTube to DeviantArt, which was the hot spot if you were in any fandom, but especially that one. We drew fan art, wrote fan fiction, and shared fan theories day in and day out. Eventually, we started writing collaborative fan fiction, which turned into role plays and started meandering into weird but harmless territory involving holding hostage the writers and creators of our favorite content, torturing them with Ren and Stimpy style music, tickle torture, and the like, and ultimately holding hands and singing kumbaya around the campfire when we all come to the agreement that us, the fans, are always right and should be respected and revered. Of course, the thought of actually coming into contact with actors and creators was utterly terrifying to us, a group of teens who only sought to have a community and see our dreamship come to fruition. Even the role plays left us squealy, giggly, and blushing. We were kids, after all. Other fandoms had similar communities popping up all over the internet. Zines to wikias to wet paint websites, which have since been archived and can still be viewed on Wikifoundry. My co-author, Rachel, had created a few forums for fandoms I was part of, like Spongebob Squarepants, and ones I wasn't, like Avatar The Last Airbender. Harry Potter had places like MuggleNet and The Leaky Cauldron, which sci-fi author Claire McBride talks about in depth in an article linked below. Though this was slightly earlier in the aughts than my group and I were surfing. Shipping and its roots. Across all these websites and all these fandoms was one common factor shipping. I'd been partaking in the ritual for a few months before I learned the name for it, and though it has become more commonplace these days, I still find myself explaining it every once in a while. Shipping has always been a common practice of fans, from Mulder and Scully in Fox's The X-Files to various controversial ships all the way back in Star Trek. The internet, however, has changed the way fans view and trade ships and their fan-created work in relation to it. In order to better understand the basics of shipping, let's have a quick review of the history. According to Wikipedia, various naming conventions have developed in different online communities to refer to prospective couples, likely due to the ambiguity and cumbersomeness of the Character 1 and Character 2 format. The first method deployed was using a slash, first used for Kirk slash Spock. This is today mainly used for same-sex ships, Fan fiction with these pairings is known as slash fiction due to fame of slash. The standard for hetero ships in fan fiction became a plus sign, like Harry plus Hermione, but an exclamation point or X can also be used as separators in place of the plus. 
Other methods of identifying relationships between characters often create hybrid terms, such as portmanteaus and clipped compounds, to abbreviate character pairings. For example, Drary forms a clipped compound abbreviated from the names Draco and Harry. These combinations often follow systematic phonological principles. I've been able to trace some of these terms all the way back to the year 1967, where they started cropping up in Star Trek fanzines such as Boldly Writing. The concept got a bit more popular in the 90s when X-Files came about, with archived forum posts such as the one linked below already beginning to explore the topic as a controversy. Fandom Isolation what we have found particularly interesting while researching and discussing fandom and shipping as topics are things that have only really gotten hairy in the past several years. There appear to be several factors that contribute to the change, not the least of which begins with the isolation of fandoms and fan groups, as well as the more hardcore separation of shippers back in the day. For instance, in the 1960s it would be extremely unlikely for you to accidentally stumble across a fandom related text without being purposeful of your source. You would be subscribed to boldly writing or similar fanzines. In the 1990s, you would have to similarly frequent forums and fan posts, typically on websites that you are already familiar with or heard about from a friend who shares your interests. Even in the relatively recent year of 2007, we had our wikis and fan clubs. Sadly, the beginning of my own fandom struck at the end of the era of peaceful shipping. Back then, you had to be very specifically searching for something in order to encounter content of any sort. Spandy shippers like myself had to use specific search terms because the engines back then were not equipped with Google's AI and had to search for hot words instead of gathering the basic gist of what we were looking for. To make it easier for other fans to find us, we created fan clubs across several platforms, beginning with YouTube. Music-themed fan vids were the most common type of shipping video back then, several of which I'm guilty of contributing to the community. I began exchanging private messages with several people my age who shared my shipping viewpoints, and in our search to make it easier to chat, we exchanged instant messenger identities. Back then, we were using Yahoo Messenger and MSN primarily, so that was where most of our shenanigans took place. We began group chats, group emails, and the like, sharing ideas and fanfiction and all sorts of content that we created ourselves. If someone didn't fit into the group, didn't share our ideals, etc., we would give them the boot. Nicely, I hope, though it's difficult to remember in retrospect. When we all started migrating over to DeviantArt was when the community flourished. It was much easier to find the things we saw, and our once tiny community exploded. We did begin to find ourselves encountering other fans who were not shippers, but we all had a tendency to really keep our distance. Fans on each side of the issue felt that they were inarguably correct, and as such, debating the topic with strangers, with whom we disagreed, was a waste of time. We would nod to each other and go our separate ways. Celebrity Interactions Technological advances in the past decade have, unequivocally, changed the way that we interact as a society. Because of social media, we are able to have interactions with people on a social level that we normally wouldn't encounter in our daily lives. We have a peek inside celebrity life and see that, like us, they are just people. I'll later cover exactly how these changes have affected our behavior as fans. In 2007, however, we still didn't have quite that level of interaction. This is why, as I mentioned before, our fan encounters were limited to role plays and fan fictions. Not only was this a harmless way of expressing our thoughts and opinions, both as shippers and general fans, but it eliminated the variable of the creators maybe not agreeing with us. Since the creators in these fantasies were, in fact, our fantasies, we had full reign of the conversations and objections. In our current year of 2018, it's quite commonplace for someone to express an opinion to their favorite creator or actor through forums like Tumblr or Twitter. Back in our day, however, this was a much more complicated process. You could send fan letters, which many fans did, or compose an email, as we were attempting to do in our Spandy forum. We wrote it, for some reason, to actress Carolyn Lawrence, despite the fact that Mrs. Lawrence did not write, produce, or direct any episodes of SpongeBob SquarePants. She is an actress, not a creator. This was something we considered monumental, to actually reach out to someone who was part of the thing we admired, using our words to speak to them. 
It was a community effort, something we were all pitching in on and helping compose. Fortunately for 2018 us, no such letter went out back then. It does showcase, though, the huge strides we have taken since then as far as how we talk to our celebrities.